Alert! 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 Spoilers ahead! Big spoilers ahead! I will be revealing character deaths, major plot points, and everything and anything else that I feel the need to point out. So, you have been warned. Do not continue on with this video if you do not want to be spoiled. You know, stop the video and maybe wait until you've actually read or watched it for yourself and then come back and watch it. Just, just a thought. I will warn you probably throughout the video, but this is your first major alert on the spoilers. You have been warned. Welcome, Dragon Riders, to a brand new episode of Reviews from an Honest Fangirl. I, of course, being the Honest Fangirl, Dragon Ninja Rider. Today I'll be covering the Inheritance Cycle, aka the Aragon series. What are my qualifications as a Dragon Rider? Well, for one thing, I love dragons. I have everything dragons, lots of dragon merch, and my username, as well as my website, says Dragon Ninja Rider. And I wrote a series, started writing a series, and have a series called Dragon Art Chronicles. So yeah, that's my qualifications as a Dragon Rider. I love dragons! And How to Train Your Dragon 2, I love that series too. I, I love too, plus he's so cute. Moving along, funny enough, I have a very interesting story that Aragon's kind of an integral part of when I started writing Dragonheart Chronicles. Back in the Dark Ages, which are the early 2000s for you young whippersnappers who don't remember what dial-up is, or don't know what dial-up is, period, yeah. I was in my 10th grade biology class, shout out to Mr. Greco, best science teacher ever, for once I actually got an A in science class, it was amazing. <laughs> funny story, he put a Chinese Zodiac calendar up on the wall. I think he got it from a Chinese restaurant. And I ran up to the thing. At this point, I'd already, I, back in eighth grade, I had discovered Mr. Potter and a certain hobbit and became fully enthralled with the fantasy genre. Up until that point, I was more general fiction slash mysteries. Grew up watching PBS's mystery masterpiece theater. A lot of Perot, a lot of Sherlock Holmes. Wasn't much of a fancy person until Harry Potter just phew, opened me up to this genre. And by 10th grade, I had read a lot of fantasy novels. So going up to the Zodiac calendar, though, I was thinking you're the tiger because school mascot plus spirit animal is my is cats. Like, seriously, I went and took my Patronus charm test on Pottermore. It's a cat. Anyway. <laughs> Go up. I'm not Year of the Tiger, I am Year of the Dragon, which was a huge shock to me. I don't, I don't know why, well, it wasn't so much a shock, it was, it was a weird sensation learning that piece of information. And not terribly long after that, I started writing Destiny's Called Arms. Well, it was a longer, more colluded title than just Destiny's Called Arms, but thank goodness, adult me realized the stupidity of the title and hacked off 90% of the ridiculous title. Enough about my poor deci writing decisions as a 16-year-old. It just had such an immense impact. I just fell in love with dragons. Dragons became my new obsession. My, my well, mythical creature obsession. I say dragons are my mythical creature spirit animal. Whilst, you know, cats are my regular spirit animal. So, fell in love, you know, started writing Dragon Art Chronicles. Wow. Aragon became a thing, didn't it? I had heard about it from a friend from, actually I think it was Tim, who was like, oh hey, you hear about this 15 year old who wrote this dragon series, it's doing really well. I'm like, I want to be the child prodigy. I was never the child prodigy. I had a lot of learning to do before. And even then I still had to fix, I still had to fix it. Destiny's cold arms, unfortunately. But anyway, I finally did end up reading Aragon in probably about round and around 11th grade-ish, somewhere in that time frame. Well, that stunk, because I'm reading him like, I cursed Paulini because he had dwarves and he had elves. Guess what was in the original draft of Dragon Heart Chronicles? That's right, dwarves and elves. Well, that killed that idea. Went in, did research, changed both cultures, uh, ended up, instead of elves, with the, the Danyas, or Danyas, apologies, I can't pronounce anything today. And, of course, I just made them Viking. Which is, you know, I took the ING off Viking, literally. Eh, it worked. And therefore, changing the kind of the spirit of Dragon Heart Chronicles in some ways. Also, 
Tika was way too much like Ari. I'm like, well, this isn't gonna work. So in college, I ended up making her personality more like a college friend of mine. Shout out to Allie. Hey, girl. Which wasn't a bad thing. In the long run, it wasn't a bad thing that I had to change some of the things about Dragon Ball Chronicles because it made it more unique. So in the end, I cannot be bad at Aragorn because it made my story better by having to change some things and using creatures or characters a little more unique to my series or, and or lesser known seer, uh, mystical creatures, people, etc. And a few other plot points that I realized I probably needed to improve. But at first, I was really irritated because I had to change two of my, my um, civilizations. I'm like, great. Well, that's just fantastic. So, sort of love-hate for it. I loved it. It was a great read. But I was annoyed because I had changed so much in my own Dragon series. Never mind. Worked out for the best. The Aragon series is a beautifully, to me, beautifully written series. It gets a lot of flack for being unoriginal. But I find that rather, well, ridiculous. And I'll get into that, of course, after the going into the history of the world of Anelisia. Alrighty, on to the world of the inheritance cycle. Before we continue on, we don't talk about the movie. Ever. Well, I'll have to talk about it for a very brief moment later on, but for all intents and purposes, we don't talk about the movie. Ever. On to, first of course, the author himself, Christopher Polini. He was homeschooled, graduating high school at the age of 15 years old. In around then was when he started writing Aragon. Once he had completed the manuscript and fleshed it out, his family's company for, published the first edition, which featured artwork that Christopher had drawn of Sephira's eye. Later on, Knuff Publishing, apologies for probably pronouncing that wrong, picked it up and published it anew in 2003. Part of the reason why Aragon became very popular and picked up momentum was the fact that Christopher was so young when he wrote the book. And the main character, Aragon, Christopher based off himself. Hence why Aragon is 15 years old at the beginning of the story because Christopher himself was 15. There are currently four books in the main series of the Inheritance Cycle, Aragon, Eldest, Brissinger, Inheritance, in that order. Along with a collection of short stories, the first volume, The Fork, The Witch, and The Worm. Now, he has mentioned there is going to be a fifth book, but what it is called and what things are going to go on in it and who the main focus is going to be in that book, we do not know yet. I'll get more into that uh, a little later on. On to the main characters of the series. Now, I can't go into too much detail about certain characters because there's a lot of plot intertwined with these characters and I don't want to spoil too much so I'm just going to go through the list as we as we go. Aragon of course and Saphira of course being the main characters, Ryder and Dragon, Arya the Elf, Rowan who is Aragon's cousin, Brom the storyteller, Murtag who is very mysterious and definitely one of my favorite characters, Galpatorix who is the main bad guy of the series, Nasida who is becomes a very important character later on in the series. Orc the Dwarf, whom I love very, very dearly, just like I do a certain other dwarf. And last but not least, the intriguing, mysterious Angela the Witch. On to the inhabitants of Alanasia. The humans, Urgals, Razak, and Elves are actually all immigrants to Alanasia. Meanwhile, the dwarves and the dragons originate from this land. There is another mention of another people called the Grey Folk. However, we still do not know if they migrated to Alanasia or they themselves, like the dwarves and the dra dragons, hail from there. There's very little left of their culture and what, little, and what there is, the elves have, and that's the only reason they even knew they existed, and they actually have a deep connection with how the magic system works in Alanasia. And so there's, there's a lot of mystery still surrounding the particular people. There are also werecats. And last, but of course not least, the mysterious Angela, the witch. I have a theory on Angela and what specifically she could be. She's obviously a witch. She's obvious, and 
has lived a very long time. But beyond that, we do not know much about her, and it's infuriating. I I have a theory, but I don't want to say it only because it would spoil some of the plot of the book. So I don't I don't want to get into that right particular moment. But yeah, at some point, I'd like to do a, a theory video about where I think the inheritance cycle is going next, especially when in regards to Angela, because she's a very, very fascinating character. All right, the magic system. It can be really contradictory and convoluted, so I'm just going to stick with the basics of the magic system here. There are magicians, sorcerers, sorceresses, and shades. Magicians are those who have a natural ability to use the ancient language to cast spells, whilst sorcerers are those who can summon spirits and control them to their will. If a sorcerer summons too strong of a spirit, they can get possessed and become shades. Shades are really nasty, magical beings. Uh, Aragon fights one in the first book, and then later on in the series, he fights another one. They're particularly very hard to kill and very powerful in magic. Dragon riders themselves gain powers from their bonds with the dragons. I'll get a little bit more into that with their own in the next slide. Elves are naturally strong magicians. They also can be writers. Magic words are simply words of the ancient language. And the language itself actually was that of the Grey Folk. And the Grey Folk cast a spell to attach their language to the magic of the land because it was mentioned from the elves in the second book that one word almost destroyed the entire land. So they wanted to make sure, you know, that didn't happen again. The language itself is simply used to keep your focus and make sure your brain doesn't accidentally focus on something else. Like if you cast the spell Grissinger and your focus, you, you intended to set your campfire alight, but you, you suddenly decide to glance at your buddy there, you might accidentally set your buddy on fire instead of the, your, your campfire. So the ancient language is used to keep your focus. You, you know, so, yeah, you could easily carefully, you have to be careful, especially with the amount of energy you use to do the spell. You could easily accidentally kill yourself or someone else by either casting the spell wrong or using too much energy. And that would use up all your energy and you'd go uh, into the void, as it is said. The ancient language itself... Christopher made it from mostly Old Norse and Celtic language, and he took a lot of creative license with it. And there's another type of magic I want to mention that's wild magic. I guess technically dragons would come under this category too. There's several things that happen in Elanasia that's kind of natural. It's very powerful magics that appear throughout the land, and there's no real explanation for it, that there's no way to say that any magician did it that it actually happened naturally. It's a very fascinating phenomenon that the that's mentioned with the elves and uh, I found was rather interesting and worthy of mentioning. Now for dragon riders themselves. Typically what happens is that pre-fall dragon eggs would be set out, young children would walk in front of them and the dragon inside would then choose their partner or rider I should say and they would hatch for them. They would gain a silver mark, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce. And hence being all, it sort of literally means sil shining palm. It kind of almost looks sort of maybe like a burn mark in a way. Aragon, funny enough, not the main character Aragon. The first rider was named Aragon, who he is named after. He created a treaty between the elves and the dragons because they fought for a long time. And, you know, two extremely powerful magical beings fighting each other. That's not a good thing. They were, dragon riders ended up becoming peacekeepers, sort of like police force of a sorts, keeping an eye on things around Elanesia until the, their downfall uh, because of Galapatorix. Dragon riders themselves would go through years of training before earning a sort of their own, and this, again, is all pre-fall. When, when the dragon riders fell, Galpat you know, all things stopped, Galapatorix took what few dragon eggs were left, and, 
you know, when we, we start the story, dragons have not been seen flying around freely for, for a long time. Uh, dragon riders also live for a long time. Um, almost could live indefinitely, practically, because of the magic of their dragons. Uh, elves, too, technically sort of are immortal in a way. But that does not mean dragon riders or elves cannot die by poison, sword wound, etc. But if they're able to, you know, avoid getting sick and, and what whatnot, they can live for a very, very long time. There is the possibility of a book five. Polini confirmed there was going to be a fifth book in 2015, and it'll, it will be a sequel. It, which I hope means that Murtag may get his own full story at some point. He deserves it, the poor guy. I really feel for that character so much. In the interview, a lot of the questions asked, he simply replied with, read book five. I'm like, that's not infuriating at all. Haha. -ha. There was nothing really anything new about book five when he uh, did promotions and interviews for his new for his sci-fi novel to sleep in a sea of stars which i have haven't really gotten to really read it yet so hopefully to do that soon, real soon there is mentioning um that there's both a prequel and sequel stories covering events throughout the series which there is the short story collection tales of aliasia so that's got book mostly stories that take place after inheritance so we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that one i can't i really hope for a second volume of that because there were some pretty pretty awesome stories in that so I'm, I'm hoping for a lot more not unlike the percy jackson fans miss pettigrew's home for peculiar children fans <laughs> the aragon fans we don't like talking about that movie not one little bit oh and avatar last airbender fans too which I am members of all of those fan bases. So yeah. Only thing I want to say is there, as of now, as of last year, there is no word on making a new one or, or a TV series for that matter. And that is all the more we're going to talk about when it comes to the movie. This is something that I really wanted to cover is that there's a lot of criticism against the inheritance cycle because of its similarities to other series. They compare it to Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. There's a couple other fantasy series that I have heard of that I've never read that they compare it to. And I just want to say it's called literature archetypes, people. All fantasy stories have some of the most typical archetypes you can think of. You've got, you know, orphan hero archetype, which of course Aragorn is. You've you've got, you know, the main villain. It's just a basic good versus evil story. Harry Potter's not unlike that. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of other fantasy series besides Aragorn that uses dwarves and elves just like Lord of the Rings. I feel like a lot of the chrisms are kind of not fair. They're really unjustified because they all seem to feel like every fantasy series has to be groundbreaking. What makes Aragon such a great series is that it is a literally Lord of the Rings for teenage boys, okay? I love Lord of the Rings so deeply. However, it is not an easy read. It took me three full starts to finally, and that was like, what was it? Two years ago, I finally actually read the entire Lord of the Rings series. I, I have read Jane Austen. I have read Shakespeare. Oh boy, was Lord of the Rings hard to read. Mostly Fellowship. Two Towers and, and Return of the King weren't as nearly as heavy as Fellowship for some whatever reason. They are not easy reads. Not every fantasy novel has to be groundbreaking. They can be enjoyable. Like a candy bar or a cup of hot chocolate. People take some of this stuff way too seriously. There are so many other stories I can think of that share similar archetypes and tropes with Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, and they're high praise to the nine. But yet, for some reason, Aragorn always gets dumped on, and I think part of the reason simply is, is that it's because it's a YA series. YA fantasy, especially YA high fantasy, is given a lot of flack for no good darn reason. And so I have some... I, I really just do not agree with a lot of the criticisms against Aragon. 
Yes, there. Are, I, I, I myself, as a Star Wars fan, see a lot of the <laughs> echoings of the Star Wars plot in it, especially in the first one. But the difference is, is that he takes it and does other odd things with it. It has its own storyline, follows its own kind of plot and everything. And in the end, it kind of definitely is definitely different from Star Wars and how Star Wars ended. Not that any of us want to, Star Wars fans want to really talk about the end of the Star Wars movies. Yeah. So, I'm, I feel like the law of the criticisms against Aragon are really unfounded or just straight up unfair. Because, just because Aragon has a lot of archetypes that are very common to fantasy. And that's what makes fantasy, fantasy are these archetypes. Are there cliches in there that are kind of like lame-ish? Yeah, but even then, they're not completely unpleasant or or completely just rubbish. They are, they are an, it's an enjoyable read, and it, it, they, he has created this very vast world. And for a 15-year-old, that's it, what he did was fantastic. When I look back at my first draft of Dragon Heart Chronicles, not only did it have a convoluted, stupid title for Destiny's Call to Arms, but there was a lot of other stupid stuff about it. Thanks to Aragon, I instantly went, okay, well, I'm going to have to change a lot. And thank goodness I did, and it made it all the better for it. So, Aragon, yes, is not necessarily a world-renowned, groundbreaking fantasy series. But it doesn't deserve all the trash that it gets. And I'll get more into that with my review. On to the review. The Inheritance Cycle is your classic high epic fantasy series. has everything that you would want. Dragons, magic swords, and infuriatingly interesting witch that I must know what she is in book five, Polini. Most importantly, dragons. Sephira's best dragon. Sorry, Toothless. Do I have issues with the series? Sure. I hack a half a star off for character lag. And this is where the spoiler alert comes in because character is an integral part of plot. Rowan, Aragorn's cousin, starts getting his own centric chapters in Eldis. And then we see them again and follow him in Brisinger and in Inheritance. Honestly, it wasn't necessary in Inheritance. Rowan's journey certainly was integral to Aragorn's in Eldis and Brisinger. Not so much in Inheritance. I was skipping those chapters. I've read Inheritance, the book proper, three times. And I'm, I know each time I tended to skim or jump over Rowan's chapters because they really didn't help the plot along at all. Some interesting commentary sure came through it, but that was about it. It really didn't progress the story enough that I felt like it was necessary to be. In Rowan's point of view, it would have been better to be having more chapters focusing on Sephira. Because I love that dragon and <laughs> love how she names things. It's just so adorable. The other half star I take off is due to kind of how Polini approached religion in this series. I just wasn't happy how there was more extremes than there was counterbalance at certain points. Arya goes after a dwarf priest in book two in Eldis. It's kind of actually hilarious. She's throwing all sorts of shade. Ha. Huh? And she says to this dwarf priest... With all the, the golden that you put into your places of worship, why don't you just focus that money in helping and feeding and clothing the poor? Well, he went off on course on a crazy tangent. And a lousy tangent at that. And I can understand the reasoning behind that. There's the classic, they walk the walk, they talk the talk, they don't walk the walk kind of scenario. Lord knows I've come across several of them in my life. Makes sense. The elves themselves don't believe or worship anything. They know the science, they know science, have science and magic and so forth, and can explain things. If one of the dwarf gods shows up, well, yeah, they'll have to rethink things a little, yes, and there are things that they admit they do not understand, though they feel like in time they will come to understand the things, they just don't currently have an explanation for certain things. Wild magic probably being one of the, being at the top of the list. And then there's a scene, and of course there's the whole cult of the Razak, those bird creatures that are completely utterly disgusting and terrifying. Yeah, people like to cut off their hands and stuff for that. Yeah, they're for them. Yeah. Clearly, you know, part of the antagonist kind of group, you know. And then 
Aragorn, of course, thinks about religion throughout the series, and that's perfectly fine and everything. I just, in the end, wasn't quite satisfied. There was a dwarf lady who represented someone who truly is a faith-based person, and I did enjoy that. Can't reveal too much about it because plot. And I wish there had been maybe one or two more people like her. Granted, Oric is a bit like that, the dwarf, and that's all I can say about the poor man, that he does have faith and he definitely talks about faith with Aragorn at several points in the series and I don't know I just didn't feel like there was enough counterbalance per se in the series I'd, I'd not as someone who understands fully what faith is now more so than I did when I originally read the books back in high school and college I don't particularly care for it it doesn't necessarily do a poor job of it I feel like it could have been better approached or each it wasn't it was shouldn't have been as approached as much as it was because it didn't necessarily have an effect on the end plot per se not too sure how i feel about it in the end just i didn't quite like it and i took a half a star off for that and footnote the magic system is broken i won't take off a, another half star for that i anything less than four stars to me feels like a kind of a negative review when it comes to like three star reviews won't do that. But I will make a footnote. <laughs> they say to Aragon, you know, don't do this. Five pages later, he's doing it, and he lives. Slightly broken. Though, granted, Polini did start writing the series when he was 15, and it's, you know, gone over all this time. All fairness, things are, there's going to be, you know, reticons and so forth. It happens in any series. Even so, a few times, like, we... Eh. So, but footnote, it doesn't bother me that much. I know for other people, it can be a sore spot when the magic system isn't nailed down perfectly. Not really a sticking point for me. Doesn't bother me that much. There's so much more that makes up for that. I do not care. Just would like to point that out for those who... It does matter. And with that, I give the Aragon series a 4 out of 5 star review. It does a beautiful job, it has beautiful characters, and even though it was kind of weak to me on the religious side of things, it does other things very well, such as dealing with PTSD. Of course, that's not what they call it in the series, but it certainly is approached, and Aragon has several conversations with certain characters, and they're wonderful conversations talking about soldiers having to deal with what they do in battle. It's beautifully done very much appreciated and respected those conversations and scenes and so forth. Fantastic job. Safira, best dragon ever. Can't emphasize that enough. And this series is a great training wheel series for any, especially 15 year old and up, who loves the Lord of the Rings movies but cannot get through Fellowship. I can't blame you. I had trouble getting through Fellowship, and I've read the Norse sagas, I read Shakespeare, even I had a trouble with, with, with Fellowship. Aragon is a great starter epic fantasy series to break into that particular section of fantasy genre. And I love it dearly, and will probably reread it again, I'm sure, sometime in the future, like I do with all my other favorite book series. Because of the violence, though, I give, I say, again, 15 and up crowd. There, there's definitely some very violent moments and creepy moments and just what, what the heck moments, specifically with the Razak, it's like, oh goodness gracious. It's definitely for the 15 and up crowd. And with that, I am ending, I come to the end of this video. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave me a like down below and leave a comment on what your favorite epic I epic high fantasy series is if it's Aragon or another series also maybe perhaps who your favorite dragon is if it's not Sephira maybe it's Toothless or the dragon from Spirited Away whose name has totally left me at this moment I probably will I am not doing a video in April I'm taking a break I will do a video in May and it will be on the Lunar Chronicles series a sci-fi fantasy series that is also fairy tale reimaginings it is one of my favorite fairy tale reimagining series and I cannot wait to do it. It's a highly enjoyable series. I have a link down below of course to all the resources featured in this video, fan art as well as fan pages, as well as my own blog. With that, may the stars watch over you.
Now, if you've enjoyed this video and like to see more, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. Thank you.